in my mind, you know, I'm thinking it was her time. Um, and I always tell people, we all have an expiration date. You and I, Dan, we all have an expiration That's date. That's the truth. Right? Yeah. Um, and I have to tell, I said, I did what I could for her. I did everything that I thought in my power. It's not my fault. And it's okay to experience empathy and sadness for what just happened because it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And you have to process that and what it means for this family. Welcome to the Emergency Mind Podcast. I'm Dan Dworkis, and this is a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. Our guest this episode is Dr. Pindi Chawa. Pindi is an emergency medicine physician currently living and practicing in Atlanta, Georgia. She's an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Emory University and the assistant medical director for the Emory University Hospital in Midtown. She did her medical school training at the University of Pittsburgh and her emergency specialty training through the Harvard-affiliated emergency medicine residency at Brigham and Women's and Mass General Hospital, where I was lucky enough to get a chance to work with her. In addition to all of that, she is one of the co-hosts of the excellent podcast, Hey Doc, Let's Chat, where she and her co-host discuss healthcare issues as they pertain to women of color. When we were doing our residency training together, I was always impressed not only by Pindi's technical skill, but by her ability to stay calm and composed in even truly chaotic situations. In this conversation, we dig into a lot of the techniques and methods that Pindi has developed over the course of her life in order to bring that calm and composure. We also get quite a bit into the why. We talk about some of Pindi's life experiences and she shares with us some really hard and really poignant stories about what she's been through in order to arrive at where she is. Pindi is a great teacher and there's a lot to learn here. Before we get started, a reminder to sign up for the Emergency Mind newsletter. It's called Knowledge Under Pressure. It's free and it's awesome. And it does deep dives into some of the topics we cover on the podcast, as well as bringing together ideas and concepts about performance under pressure from all over the universe. You can find it at emergencymind.com slash sign up. Also, since this is the last episode of 2020, I hope it finds you and yours healthy and safe and happy. I hope 2021 is going to be a much better year for all of us. Okay, all that said, let's get to it. I hope you enjoy. All right. Well, Pindi, thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk to me. It is so cool to get to sit across from you like this again and sort of talk about life, the universe, and everything. And I'm I'm honored to have you. I am so excited to be on the show, Dan. I've been listening to your episode, particularly some with our classmates. And so this is quite the honor to be here as a guest on your show. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And, you know, I was reflecting about our time together back in Boston, and I was thinking particularly about the large number of times when I was just starting out and you were, I don't know, maybe two years ahead of me, maybe a year, I forget. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I was just starting out, there's all these memories of us working together in these really intense situations and me sort of like running around like a chicken with my head cut off (laughs) and looking over at you and seeing you just so calm. Like, like you were like, you were always known not just for like your technical skill, but you're just like peacefulness in the place and your smile and your laugh. And I remember you looking at me and super politely and kindly telling me some version of like, Dan, chill the hell out. Like it's going to be okay. (laughs) And just looking at you being like, how does that happen? Oh man. Yeah. That is, you know, when people meet me, that's often the quality that they always point out that I'm kind of this quiet, calm in the midst of the storm. And I, I really don't know how to sort of explain that, but I probably contributed to my life experiences, honestly. Um, I've lived in a lot of places, I've been through a lot of things. Um, and in the midst of all of that, I have had to find a way to process, a way to deal when things get tough. And so I've always um, just been in tune with that silence um, and just in tune with my faith. And I think that has really helped me through a lot of life situations. And so in the ER, oftentimes when things are going mad, which they often do, I have always tried to find a, a still place within my heart to just, you know, quiet, just listen and reflect and think and, and really process and not uh, quickly react. And that has really helped me in a lot of situations. 
Yeah, that's that's amazing and something I can like personally vouch for having watched you do that many times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but what is that like? Like press on that. Like when you say you find a still place in your heart, mm-hmm. is there like a mantra you use or a prayer mm-hmm. or a thought or are you are you doing biofeedback? Like what do you do? <laughs> so, you know, I would say that just my my personality, I have always said pause, right? And and I don't know at what point in life that has happened. I've just always taught myself, okay, things are getting really hectic, just pause. Um, pause and really reflect and think about the current situation and what is happening and explore that place in your heart that is um, peaceful, that is quiet and and what that, you know, means to you. Um, and so I, I honestly don't know where, at what point I developed that skill, to be honest with you. Um, I think, you know, when you, I look back at situations in life and think about the places, the amount of times I've had to move, um, originally from Swaziland, Africa, moved to California when I was around nine, um, and, you know, moved as an immigrant um, and went automatically joined a school as the only black person there and having to be teased and, you know, really be in situations where um, it was quite uncomfortable. Um, And then moving from California to Wisconsin, Menominee, Wisconsin, Northern Wisconsin, where I was again, um, the only black person within the whole high school really, and having situations where, which were really difficult. Um, And I really had to find a way to process those emotions um, a way to deal with difficult situations in my life, you know, being different, um, being teased. And I think that somewhere along the line, I learned what it meant to to pray, to meditate, um, and to really um, delve into um, that still small voice and just knowing when to become, when to pick my battles. And so those experiences in life outside of the workplace are always going to spill into the workplace. And so it's not just how I live my life on the job. It's also how I live my life outside of the job. And so I've really learned um, what that means. Um, and you always, you're always a um, advocate of you know, mindfulness. And I think in a way, um, that is something I often practice daily. Um, and those things just help me in difficult situations. And so I think learning those skills early on has helped me continue to use them within my life and within my job. And when you were younger, when you were an earlier version of Pindi, did you have... Um, was it your parents? Did you have teachers? Did you have older friends that you could come to and say, hey, how do I, how do I handle this like mm-hmm. boiling thing inside of me? Or, mm-hmm. or how did you, you know, who did you talk to about that? So oftentimes I can't say that my house was quiet. <laughs> so I can't really say that I learned that from my parents. You know, um, my dad is an African male and, you know, he he doesn't really utilize that still small voice. And I can't really say that my mom is a calm person either. So I think oftentimes, even in my home, there was a lot of chaos. Um, and so as a child, I think I always had to... Um, explore what that meant for myself. And so I can't really say that I learned that from somebody. I think it was a coping mechanism uh, with all the things that were happening. And I just explored that on my own. Um, Did a lot of reading, um, did a lot of, you know, thinking and looking through stuff. And um, I think for me, religion early on was really something that I had to tap into to help me deal with a lot of situations. And so my faith, um, I think, is probably what taught me. Um, And then I think I also taught my myself a little bit about the faith. And so I think in reading and, and exploring in that curiosity of being a child, I really meant what I really learned what it meant to um, be still. And so I would probably say that my faith taught me um, some of the skills that I u- utilize at work in terms of um, coping in difficult situations. Mm. And I'm going to pause here for a second because um, you run this totally amazing podcast called Hey Doc, Let's Chat um, with your co-host, Dr. Dr. T, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And if you all haven't listened to that, you absolutely should. And your episode, uh, I forget what the exact title is, but essentially it's an episode on structural racism Mm. is super, super cool and incredibly worth listening to. And you tell a lot more of sort of the story of coming up in school and stuff in, mm-hmm. in that episode. And I would, I would, t- in fact, stop this, listening to this podcast and go listen to that <laughs> podcast and, and come back and, and finish this one. Um, Thank you. But it's really wonderful to hear you all dig into that. And, and it strikes me that 
perhaps some of the reason of doing that is to share some of these lessons that that you've learned about bringing mm-hmm. that peace and calm into everything that you do um and maybe serving as a sort of a, a voice and a counterpoint to mm-hmm. help other people who are going through similar or different situations, but learning mm-hmm. how to handle their own internal pressure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really think that, you know, me and my friend, my co-host, Dr. T, we were sitting one day and really talking about our experiences as women of color within our job, women of color coming you know, into the educational system and really as patients. And we were just talking about our different experiences. And what we realized is that we shared a lot of experiences. Um, a lot of the, you know, you talk about being uh, a woman of color in um, academia and in, in medicine and just the the obstacles that you may face or the imposter syndrome that we go through and just feeling like we don't always fit in you know, you want to fit in, you want to feel a part, but oftentimes it's just, it's difficult because you also bring different experiences and trying to relate with people on that level sometimes is difficult. And you don't mean to um, be, uh, what's the word, different or be outcast, but it just, it just happens because your upbringing is a little bit different. And so we just kind of channeled that and talked about what our patients would go through and when they're coming into the medical system and they're coming to the hospital and trying to explain the symptoms they're going through and the context and the social economic dynamics that they're going through and really just the difficulties that they may face in communicating with that person in front of them and how that must be difficult for them. And so we just said, you know, that five or 10 minutes that we have as physicians oftentimes is not really enough to break these things down or have conversations with our patients. And we're like, let's just get on a mic and talk about being a patient, talk about being a woman of color in medicine, talk about doctor, and also just breaking down healthcare topics as they pertain to people of color. And so we really enjoy doing it. Uh, we're really passionate about it because it is something we live. It's something that we experience on a daily basis. And we know that our experiences can help other people um, deal with uh, whether they are people of color or whether they're on the other side of the spectrum just to understand each other a little bit more. And so it's great. It's great doing it. Um, and I just feel like it's one of those platforms that is needed within our community. Uh, it's it's so cool. Please definitely go listen to that. What an what an awesome podcast and a great project. <laughs> Thank you. And I think you're you're hitting on something that is sort of a common theme among people that have come on the show to talk about performance under pressure, which is that while you while your performance under pressure is part of your job, right, and occurs mm-hmm. in sort of your your job space where you're an operator of one sort or another, so much of how to do that comes from the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And that there's not really this thick barrier between what you do, you know, stethoscope on time versus stethoscope off time. And you learn it in the rest of your life. Yes. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily obvious. Well, let me, let me ask that question. Do, was that something that came to you, that idea, because of other things that you'd been through? Or was that something that came to you because of how we were trained? I'm sort of no. leading you. Sorry, but yeah. oh no, it's it's definitely life experiences. You know, I can I can go. You know, I've always said one day I'm just going to sit and write a book of mm. all the things that I've been through in life. But it comes from life experiences, and and one of the things that I would say is, and I talk about this in one of my podcasts, is um, I had a miscarriage early on in mm. my uh, career. Um, starting out as an attending and so many things about that miscarriage. I just wish I could go back and just do things a little bit differently. But I remember the time I had the miscarriage, um, it was on a Friday. Um, And then Monday came and I was back at work, even though I had not completed the miscarriage and I was in so much discomfort and so much pain emotionally and physically, but the fear of taking off the fear of not wanting to be home as a new black female attending and just not, not wanting people to think that, you know, hey, she's a slacker, um, you know, or look at me different or, you know, just thinking I have strength to get through this. You know, I'm a woman, um, you know, I'm in academic. I got to just come and, and do this, come to work and push through. And so that was number one. And then also going through it and trying to um, 
get into the system, you know, I, we have a very busy OB service. And so when I was going through things that week, I was calling as a patient um, and I, I couldn't get through the line to talk with the nurse. I was trying to leave messages. I was trying to write on the portal. I was trying to really reach somebody and I couldn't reach anybody for a week. And so I showed up at the OB office and I was like, hey, I got to talk to somebody. I got to talk to somebody because my body, something's going on. I just... I just, I don't know what's going on. I'd like to speak with the nurse. And um, the clerk at the time was like, let me go check, went back and looked at a, to find a nurse. And um, she came back, she said, sorry, there's no nurse who can talk to you right now. I said, okay, well, is there a physician who can come and talk to me, anybody? So she goes back, she says, nope, sorry, there's no physician who can talk to you. And I'm thinking, listen, I work downstairs. I know I'm in like some street clothes, but if anybody from this clinic was going through something and they came to my emergency department, I was like, hey, listen, I cut myself with a, you know, paper clip. Can you sew me up? Like we would do that. You know, we would do that. We do that all the time in our department. And so I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I work here. I know I'm in my street clothes. I don't have... Um, I don't have, you know, my badge or anything, but I work here, I, I promise, you know, and so nobody could speak to me. And I think I just started bawling. I started crying in the, in the yeah. waiting room. And it was one of those moments where I was like, man, I am on the other side. Like, I am on the other side. I'm trying to access the healthcare system. And I'm having an incredibly difficult time. And I'm a physician and I work downstairs. What more are my patients going through? Yeah. And so just thinking about that and the experiences that I went through and what my patients go through, I was like, man, sometimes we think it's, it's just as easy as that. Hey, go, you know, here's your medication, go pick it up in the store, you know, and uh, take care of yourself, treat your blood pressure. We don't know the things that people have to go through in accessing those blood pressure medications. We don't know the things that, the obstacles that people have to go through to get to their appointments, to make their appointments, to find childcare and all of those things. And so I think it comes from experience. It's, it's difficult to, I think Emily on your last episode, Dr. Brumfeld mentioned something about it hard to fake empathy, right? You cannot fake um, being empathetic. You, you can't do that. Your experiences are going to shine in how you take care of people. Essentially, your life experiences, the things that you go through are going to come into the way you practice medicine. And so it's not something that can be taught. Um, it can be taught to a certain degree, but your life experiences mean so much more on the job, man. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Just so many things in that. And the, the image of, of you crying in a waiting room is, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and I think you're right that we don't, especially in the emergency room when we are running and putting out fires, you know, my emergency room literally caught on fire last night briefly, but we fixed it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, long story. I'm not going to go into it, but you know, we're putting out these fires and we're trying so hard to take care of people. And, and so much of that sometimes feels like it means that we don't have time to see the human on the other mm -hmm. side of the thing. And I think it was, was our mutual friend, you know, Dr. Emily Brumfield that said that, that said that she used to think of humanness as something she had to stop and leave at mm -hmm. the door when she went into work. And then only later is she starting to understand that that's actually like the strongest part of mm -hmm. her as a physician. Okay. I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, I wonder how you and I and Dr. Brumfield and everybody else do a better job teaching that. Because mm. we're both also in charge of, of teaching residents and, and working yeah. with people and trying to, to be examples for the next generation of ER physicians coming up, you know, with us and behind us. And how do we do that? How do we teach better that balance of human and doctor? Because I think that if we did that, we'd probably also end up accidentally teaching people how to be better under pressure. Mm. That's my guess. Hmm. But I don't know. What, mm. what do you think about that? Well, I think one is really identifying the positive qualities in our learners and amplifying those qualities. And so when you identify that 
a learner has a you know positive quality for example they're a really good listener or they communicate really well with nurses or um, you know just trying to um, amplify that and so really giving them the feedback and encouraging them and saying you know what I see how you communicate with the nurses and that is a really positive quality um, and something that you should continue and and continue that wherever you practice because that is um, of invaluable skill set that not a lot of people have. And also just know that patiency, how you communicate with nurses. They see Mm -hmm. how you treat the people within the hospital and they also value that and they, they, they bond with that and they actually trust in you and they trust that you are going to take care of them. And so one is, I think, identifying the positive qualities that residents have and then also supporting their weaknesses as well. And so when you notice that, you know, they may not communicate well or, or, you know, talk with the patients or spend that time in the patient's room as much as they should, you know, not being, you know, judgmental with that, but just saying, hey, you know, did you have an opportunity to sit down with Mm. patient in room three and just talk to them and talk to them about their life? Because, you know, like we have the, 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 how can I say, we have the opportunity as attending physicians where we have a little bit more time on the hand. So the residents are running around trying to do things. And so oftentimes we have a little time, we can go sit in and, you know, hear a little story from the patient in room three about, you know, World War II or whatever they went through and we can have those conversations. And so I think coming back and you know, talking to the residents, especially if you know they're a little bit weaker in that area. I mean, just say, hey, did you have an opportunity to, you know, speak to room three? I mean, he has an amazing story. You should really go in there and just Mm -hmm. listen to him about his life. Um, Those are some things I do. And other things also, you know, for example, when uh, let's say a resident is prescribing a certain medication, let's say they're giving this medication to um, Joe, who Joe is homeless. Joe doesn't have anywhere to live. Joe is not going to be able to fill his prescriptions medication. So you're writing this prescription and you're expecting Joe to fill the prescription, but just, and you're not thinking about Joe as a person. You're not thinking that Joe doesn't have a home. Joe doesn't have money. And so oftentimes our our residents may be too busy to realize that depending on where they train actually. Um, And so helping them understand that and saying, you know what, like Joe doesn't have money. Joe likely would not be able to fill this prescription. How do you think that we can get Joe to be compliant? What things can we offer Joe? And so that's when plugging into where does Joe live? Um, Do we have services within the hospital that can help Joe? Do we have the social work? What can be done? Do we have programs that can give free prescriptions? And so I think stopping and trying to remind our residents that, listen, it's not just about Joe has pneumonia. Here's some antibiotics. It goes beyond that. It's about Joe's socioeconomic, um, just the entire um, dynamics of who he is, like socially, um, how much he has, where he lives, um, how is he going to have access to take these medications. And so I think trying to tell our residents these things and sort of hone in and just continue to remind them that let's think about this as a whole, not just like A plus B is equal to, you know, this way. Everything is not straightforward. And so that's how I often try to teach my residents these things. The other things, you know, empathy and compassion, I think those are difficult skill sets to teach, but they could be, they come with time. And I think just continuing to remind um, our learners to uh, take the time with our patients and our staff and, you know, everybody else in the hospital, I think they can try, they can learn a little bit. Um, but definitely we have room to teach our learners how to look at the person more than just their medical sense, but their social, their mental, emotional, um, cause they're people too. They are. So. Mm. You know, I, I'm, I'm struck as I'm listening to you say that, that I wonder if part of being good at that is related to the same part of you that has done so much introspection about yourself. Mm. Because I wonder if that part of that empathy and compassion and seeing that person as a human comes from your own work internally as what what does it mean for me to be a human and how do mm-hmm. I relate to myself and society? Mm-hmm. Um, because I think that that one, that not everybody has spent as much time being introspective. And it, mm-hmm. in a sense, 
reflecting on yourself like that is a real skill that requires practice and effort and energy. Mm -hmm. And two, I think not all of us as attendings model that piece of it all the time, Mm -hmm. right? It's easy to sort of model the, you know, this is pneumonia, pneumonia requires this antibiotic. It's harder to model that I am hurting and I am feeling this emotion and I'm still showing up for work Mm. because I'm trying to figure out what it is to be a human and a professional to occupy a role as a part of society and also out of society as a doctor at the same time. Um, Mm. I love that. I love what you just said. Everything is not straightforward. Like mm-hmm. that's, <laughs> you know, I wish I had a t-shirt that said that. Like, everything is not straightforward. It, not in medicine, not yeah. in medicine either. So. <laughs> For sure. And, you know, I, there's a concept that we talked about in one of the earlier episodes with Dr. L.A. Alvarez. Uh, that's part of the work done by the Mission Critical Teams Institute, which is this concept of this thing called residue right? The idea that you go through an event and that event leaves a residue on you in one mm. form or another. And it, it um, it's something that you, you know, you can ignore it temporarily mm-hmm. at, at sort of at your own peril. Mm-hmm. Um, but processing that residue is part of, is part of being an ER doctor, part of showing up and, and honestly really part of coming home too, mm-hmm. right? as much as we're saying that there's such tight links between what you do at your job and what you do in the rest of your life, we do have these transition points, these, these barriers that are more or less solid. And and I think that transition between showing up at work and coming home is such an important, huge piece. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like for you? What do you do coming home? How do you process before you go back to your, your awesome family? Yeah. Yeah, this this is something that I think I've, um, you know, kind of learned and tweaked and, you know, used some of my um, upbringing to get through. But I would say that when I come home, and I'll speak for now because things are definitely different now, right? We have a, a pandemic going on and, and it's really tested how we look at our own um, uh, humanity, how we look at ourselves and our mortality at this point. Um, So I would say that when I go through a difficult situation at work, um, I often will take some time at work to process that situation. So whether it's sitting in my desk and, you know, taking a moment of silence, and oftentimes I may not have that opportunity, but I don't know if it was you when we were in um, residency and I talked about my walks around the department. (laughs) Yeah. I, I have this thing where, if I've had a difficult situation and I just need to process that, I'll take that lap around the department um, or I'll take that lap outside of the department and just take a walk. Um, And in that walk, I think I am processing, I'm practicing mindfulness. I'm taking an opportunity to process what I just went through. You know, we see a lot of death. We see a lot of suffering. We see a lot of inequity. And as much as we think that I can just put that in a bucket, you know, behind my brain and keep, keep it moving, that's not how those things will add up, those things will affect us. And so at the moment, we have to be able to deal with that in some way. And so I walk away and I ask myself, I'm like, what am I feeling? What am I feeling? Um, And what does this mean? Um, And I just kind of ask myself those questions and I reflect and I also think, what is the patient's family feeling? Um, What does this mean for them? Um, And I often will take the opportunity, whether it's a moment of silence or whether it's an opportunity to just say a little prayer for that family and or or say a little prayer for me to get through that shift, because I also need a little strength to get through when something difficult happens, when I lose, you know, that that mother or that um, uh, grandmother. I also needed a little opportunity to process. And then I came come back and I come back with a renewed sense of mind, renewed sense of gratefulness, renewed sense of just being, and I can go on the day and take care of other patients. And when I get home, I think it also helps because I also don't have to dump that energy on my family, right? You know, they didn't, you know, I mean, they signed up to be with an emergency doc, but you know, like. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, yeah. They didn't sign but up even, for that. Yeah. 
they didn't, they didn't sign up to be my dumping ground, you know, of all my bags of emotions and everything that I went through. And they don't deserve that. They deserve love. Um, they deserve my time. And so oftentimes I'm able to, um, just be grateful for that home, be grateful for that love within the home and my, my child and, and kind of move past that while still reflecting at the life that was lost. And, but also being grateful for um, me being around and being here and, and living and breathing. And so really looking at the positives within my own life. So I don't dump those negative experiences upon my family. Right. Um, oftentimes, however, you get into a situation where you have to share, right. There's you, there's, you can't, you gotta, you gotta share with somebody because that's also therapy in a sense. Right. So you have to talk about it. And so I, once in a blue moon, I will talk about a situation with those that I love and, and process and, you know, they listen and just that comfort of their voice or the hug helps me deal with it. Um, and then I always also do therapy. I've learned, you know, I grew up not really, um, mental health is not something that, um, you know, I remember the first time I told my mom, my mom down, I think I'm down, I think I'm depressed, you know, and she's like, uh, no, like I don't, like, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. You're just having a bad day. Just, just keep it moving. I'm like, okay, all righty. Well, that was that. And so, you know, you use words like down or I don't feel right. And, you know, I don't know how to deal with this. And so you don't really know how to deal a process. And so I think in the last year or two, I've really learned about therapy. I say the last year, I probably utilized therapy and it, just, I just wish I had found out about it at an earlier age because having somebody to talk to and process is also um, just invaluable experience, especially for the line of work we do. And so I would encourage anybody if they have the opportunity to just sit down and talk with a therapist. We're going through, the lot, through a lot. We have seen a lot. At some point, we like that bucket that we're hiding things, things overflow. They overflow and they affect us. They affect our job. They affect our families. And so therapy is invaluable for me. Um, and so I think that's how I deal with it and sort of protect my family from that baggage um, that I uh, bring back from work. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. That's uh y'all can't see us, but I I've been nodding like this entire time. Man. <laughs> I, I feel that. I feel what you're saying. That bucket, I, that is a, a real bucket. thing. It's yeah. a um, I want to press on one thing that you said, which is as you're, and I want to get a little bit granular on this and gritty. So you're walking mm -hmm. around and, and you had some crazy event happen. You know, you, you lost a young patient or you mm -hmm you know, you're, you just were part of a case where there was just really hard trauma and mm -hmm. you're, you're feeling it. Whatever reason that case that day you, you were feeling it and, and you recognize that in yourself, which like sidebar is a skill to recognize, mm -hmm. Hey, I'm feeling something. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. So you're feeling it. You go on this walk and you said that you ask yourself, what am I feeling and what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Wow. What a, what a fascinatingly strong, wonderful wording to those questions. Like, what do those answers look like? How, how do you know what you're feeling? How do you know mm. what it means? What, what does that conversation look like in your, in your head? Yeah. So, you know, generally it's like, I feel so sad. I feel so sad for this individual who is a mother who has three kids. And I'm looking at the child. Um, and I'm looking, and this is usually either before I'm given the bad news or after, um, but I'm looking at the child or thinking about the child and I'm thinking to myself, what it must be like for that person to lose someone they love so much. Um, and I'm processing that. I'm processing what that means for me as a mother um, and what that, what my child would have to experience and what they would feel to know that I have left them. Um, and so that sadness, I'm feeling sadness. I'm feeling um, upset. I'm feeling upset that I could not save them. I'm feeling upset. I'm asking myself, could I have done more, right? And, you know, then I process that. I process what that means. And I, then it's like almost like a, you know, a, a pep topic in a way. It's like, you did what you could. 
you did what you could. And, you know, often people don't like hearing this or it, 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 you know, it doesn't always help people. And I don't always say this to people, but in my mind, you know, I'm thinking it was their time. Um, and I always tell people, we all have an expiration date. You and I, Dan, we all have an expiration That's date. The truth. Right? Yeah. Um, and I have to tell, I said, I did what I could for her. I did everything that I thought in my power. It's not my fault. And it's okay to experience empathy and sadness for what just happened because it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And you have to process that and what it means for this family. And so I think when I'm having these conversations and I have to go and sit or deliver that, you know, bad news to the family, I feel like I often have these weird bonding experiences. Maybe the family doesn't experience that, but from my end, I have this experience where I feel like it's someone, you know, I try to just empathize with them. And it, some, oftentimes it's like, it treat them like as if it's someone I know, you know, and it, like kind of move that, you know, oftentimes it's like, there's this distance on the doctor, this is a family, you know? So I feel like I've kind of put myself in their shoes and I'm experiencing, I've experienced a process, I've taken my walk, I've processed what they are feeling. And I'm able to deliver that news, knowing the impact that it's going to have on their family, knowing the impact that it's going to have on their lives. And I feel like I come from a different angle. Um, I'm a little stronger when I'm delivering that news, but I'm also more supportive. I'm also more empathetic. And so the walks are so crucial for my well-being, but also for the strength that I need to be able to deliver bad news to that family, to be able to get through that shift for my for my nurses, for my residents, for the entire department, for the next patient that's coming in. Because if I'm emotionally deflated, how can I take care of that next person that comes in? So the walks are crucial. I'm having a lot of conversations um, with myself, but also encouraging myself and giving myself a pep talk, you know, because tomorrow, inevitably, the same thing will repeat itself, right? Um, it's a never-ending thing in our job. Bad news comes, bad things happen. Um, yeah. And you have to be able to pick yourself up and do it again. Right, right. You have to be able to pick yourself up and do it again and, and bring your whole self to bear whole for that self. next person who yep. needs you just as much as the one before. Exactly. Yeah. It It strikes me as you're saying this that, you know, I can look at what to somebody else would look like a jumbled mass of numbers on a screen or a jumbled <laughs> bits of things on an x-ray and I can find a pneumonia and diagnose an NSTEMI. But sometimes still looking inward, all I see is a jumbled mass of things. And mm -hmm. to break that down into, I feel sad, I feel mm -hmm. angry, I feel frustrated, I feel this, and this is why. Mm -hmm. is, boy, that sometimes isn't easy, especially in the, especially in the moment with all oh, of yeah. the you know, you still have the blood on your scrubs and on your hands oh, yeah. and you're, you're trying to move to the next thing. Um, I'm going to try that walk. I like that a yeah, lot. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to call it a, a Pindy walk. That's like the Pindy our, walk. The Pindy walk. <laughs> Oh, man. We'll, we'll give you give you credit. Is that, if anybody asks what I'm doing, it's going to make it sound very official too. It's wonderful. <laughs> we'll write that up. Write that up. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's a really wonderful. That's a really wonderful thing. Um, and I think goes so much hand in hand with this idea of processing residue, setting yourself the space to reflect, and what you said at the very beginning: pause and reflect, pause mm -hmm. and reflect before you move on. Um, and how much strength there is in that different and complementary to your ability to move forward and yeah. to, to, you know, to wield your craft. We are coming sort of close to the end of our time with this. And, and before we do, I want to make sure uh, that you have a chance to issue a challenge to everybody mm. listening, mm -hmm. right? So to all of the people listening to this, it, you know, if they're in shoes similar to yours or mine or not at all, what is it that you want them to try this week? How do you want them to get better and, and to learn more about themselves and be better at performing under pressure? Mm. You know, the challenge I want to issue is that when you're taking care of a patient, um, whether they're in the emergency department or wherever, I want you to stop and take the opportunity to think beyond the pathophysiology of the illness that that patient is going through. But I want you to take the moment, whether it is to talk about that person and talk about, you know, what they do, 
um, what they do for a living, uh, you know, their circumstances and really try to approach that person from uh, an, a whole perspective, a whole point of view. Um, and I think you'll find and you'll learn so many things about that individual that will give you an insight into um, whether it is their medication or their, you know, the, the path of his other disease or whether it's um, just why they're there or just the entire person itself. So I, I just issue, I want you to just look at that person and say, you know, why aren't they doing this? It's more than maybe what I think. Let me just take an opportunity to get to know them as a person. Um, and I feel like patients appreciate that because you are not treating them like just, a, you know, uh, a diagnosis. You're, you're, you're thinking about them more than just why they're there. You, you care about them. And so I think you'll get more information. People will open up to you a whole lot more. And you'll also find some satisfaction in your job as well, because you take this opportunity to learn about people. And it's the best part of our job. You know, we, we get to talk to people all day yeah. and we get to learn so many things. So I, I really feel like in a sense that you'll gain some job satisfaction in learning about your patients. Um, so that's the charge. <laughs> And the Pindy Walk, do the Pindy Walk. Try that too. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Pindy, thank you so much. Thank you for everything you taught me as I was coming up and everything you're still teaching me about how to do this job. And, and thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate it. And keep doing what you're doing. It's fantastic. Okay, folks, that brings us to the end of this conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found something useful that you can use next time you find yourself in an emergency or a crisis. Again, if you want to dig deeper into a lot of the concepts that we covered here, sign up for the Emergency Mind newsletter, Knowledge Under Pressure. It is free and it is awesome. You can join by going to www.emergencymind.com slash sign up. Also, as a reminder, our mission here at The Emergency Mind is to dig into lessons around applying knowledge under pressure, not to provide medical advice. Our opinions, as expressed on this podcast or elsewhere, are our own and not necessarily those of our employers or the hospitals at which we work. So keep up the good work, keep training, and good luck out there.